So what did we just show? We showed that separable dual spaces have the infinity martingale convergence property. And as I was saying before, to answer Calvin's question in the chat, actually all of the martingale convergence properties are equivalent, but we haven't proved that yet. Uh, yes, yeah, so I wanted to show some examples of separable dual spaces, which I forgot to show before. So as I said, L1 is the dual of C0. That's a separable dual space, little L1. So the sequence space L1 has the Martin-Gale convergence property, the infinity one. Uh, LP spaces for P between one and infinity. These are duals of LP prime. So these are separable dual spaces for all measure spaces S. But yeah, you have this P greater than one restriction. Um, I want to point out as well that C0, okay, not C0, but L infinity, which is bad. We know it doesn't have the Martin-Gale convergence property. It is a dual space. It's the dual of L1, but it's not separable. So the separability is the obstruction for L infinity, not the, it, it is a dual space, but it's not separable. You need both of these properties. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, separability seems pretty important, but it's not necessary. At least it's not necessary for proving Martin-Gale convergence properties. One property that separability does come in, we need a lemma. Given P, the P Martingale convergence property is what's called separably determined. And what I mean by that is X has this property, PMCP, if and only if every separable subspace y of x, every closed, sorry, every closed separable subspace has the PMCP property. So if you're showing that a Barnack space has the Martin-Gale convergence property, you don't need to look at the whole space. You just need to look at every separable subspace individually. And if all of them have this property, then the whole space does. And in the interest of time, I'm going to do the proof really quickly because the proof is not really that interesting. One direction is sort of clear. If X has a Martin-Gale convergence property, all of its subspaces do. Okay, fine. In particular, all of the separable subspaces do. That's the only if direction. The if direction, which is the more interesting one, deducing that X has the Martin-Gale convergence property from the corresponding property of all of its separable subspaces. Well, take, take an X-valued Martin-Gale then each Fn is strongly measurable by definition. Pettis tells you that each Fn is separably valued. And then you take a, a union of all of the, the ranges of Fn and you look at the subspace that generates, that generates another closed separable subspace. So there exists a closed separable subspace of X such that the Martingale F bullet is Y valued. And then you use the assumption that Y has the Martingale convergence property. So the P one, I should have taken F to be an LP bounded Martingale plus uniformly integrable if P is equal to one. So the Martingale is actually valued in a separable subspace from the beginning. And that separable subspace by assumption has the P Martingale convergence property. So F bullet has an almost everywhere limit. And that's the whole proof. That wasn't too hard.
basically the objects we're using to define this property only ever have separable ranges anyway. So it follows that the property that we're defining has to be separably valid, separably determined. So this isn't a this is a, it's a geometric property of the Banach space, but it doesn't really see the whole space at once. It just sees the separable aspects of the space. And this lemma here is pretty innocuous. It seems sort of obvious and like, okay, why is this a big deal? Because it lets us prove something that's actually quite interesting in a very funny way. To the corollary. If X is reflexive, then X has the infinity Martingale convergence property. Reflexive, of course, means if you don't remember the canonical inclusion from X to its double dual is uh, an isomorphism. It's always an isometry. It's an injective isometry, but it's not always surjective. When it's surjective, that's reflexivity of the Barnack space X. And just as a quick example, if you take our favorite Barnack space, our favorite Hilbert space, L2 with counting measure of the real line, the sort of canonical non-separable Hilbert space. So it's not separable but it is reflexive because Hilbert space is always reflexive. So therefore it has the infinity Martingale convergence property, even though it's not separable. That kind of makes sense because all of the separable subspaces are based, they're separable Hilbert spaces. So, you know, they're kind of nice. Yeah. Let's do this proof. How do we relate reflexivity of X to this condition that we know that gives you the Martingale convergence property being a separable dual space. It's a very nice argument here. It suffices to show that every separable closed subspace of X has the infinity Martingale convergence property by the lemma we stated before. Martingale convergence property is separably determined. So we only need to consider the separable closed subspaces. Now, since separable duals have this Martingale convergence property, it suffices to show that every closed subspace of X is a dual space. Because then in particular, every separable subspace of X is a separable dual space, therefore has the Martingale convergence property and therefore X itself has the Martingale convergence property. So this is the, the clever reduction that you can use reflexivity to, to prove. Okay, that wasn't very well explained. We haven't used reflexivity yet. We're going to use reflexivity to prove this. This is what we want to show. Every closed subspace of X is a dual space. And X is reflexive. Let's suppose Y is a closed subspace of X. And consider what's called the annihilator. The very dramatically named object. The annihilator is written as Y perp. So perpendicular to Y, Y perp. It is the set of functionals in the dual of X, which annihilate Y. <laughs> the set of all functionals that kill everything in Y, send everything in Y to zero. It's like an orthogonal complement, but we're not working in a Hilbert space. So we need to look in the dual. So we consider the annihilator and we also consider the double annihilator, which is the, is the annihilator of the annihilator. Oops, wrong color. 
this is y perp perp. And if you were in a Hilbert space, you would think this is the space we're starting at, you know, the orthogonal complement of the orthogonal complement. But we're not in Hilbert spaces. So this is the annihilator of y perp. And by definition, this is the set of all functionals in the double dual of x, such that z paired with x double star is zero for all z in the annihilator of y. So all of the functionals in the double dual of x that annihilate everything that annihilate everything in y. Okay, easy. So then using a result from functional analysis that I assume everybody knows, but you know, you don't really know this, that's okay. Then the double annihilator of Y is isometrically isomorphic to the dual of X quotient, the annihilator of Y dual. <laughs> okay. This is actually a general result, which takes the following form. Let me write it sort of clearly. If you have a subset A of X, then the annihilator of A is isometrically isomorphic to X quotient A dual. I assume some of you have seen quotient spaces, some of you have not, particularly quotients of Barnack spaces. And I don't particularly want to explain them right now if you haven't seen it. But what you can take home from this without knowing what a quotient is, is that the double annihilator of Y is a dual space. That's all we're going to use. If you know what the quotient is, great. If you don't know what the quotient is, you go home and study this later on. Just take as given for the moment that the double annihilator of Y is a dual space. That's what we're going to use. So now it suffices to show. We wanted to show that Y was a dual space, right? Now what we want to show is that the canonical embedding of Y is actually the double annihilator of Y. X is reflexive. So this canonical embedding is an isomorphism. So if the double, so since Y double perp is a dual space, it follows that Y is a dual space once we show this. And that would, this is our goal to show that Y is a dual space. So we've reduced it to showing that the canonical embedding of Y is the double annihilator. Now we prove this by proving the two inclusions of the left-hand side into the right-hand side or the right-hand side into the left-hand side. So first we show that the canonical inclusion of Y is contained in the double annihilator. This basically comes from the definitions. It's not too hard to show, but let's unpack it. For all Z in the annihilator of Y, uh, and for all Y in Y, when you pair Z against the canonical inclusion of Y, what we need to do is show this is zero because this would say that everything that's all of the embedded vectors y annihilate everything that annihilate everything in y. <laughs> we want to show this is equal to zero. By definition of the canonical inclusion, this is the pairing of y against z. And z kills everything in y. <laughs> and y is in y. So that's zero. I really like this proof. It's really simple, but this just goes to show like the definitions are just nicely compatible. So we're done there. The harder part's the other direction. Everything that is in the double annihilator of Y was actually just in Y to begin with, up to the up to J, up to the canonical inclusion. And we prove this indirectly. We suppose that we have a functional x double star that is not in the canonical embedding of y. And we will show that this vector is not in the double annihilator of y. So then by contrapositive, if x double star is in y double perp, 
then x double star is in j of y, which is what we need to show. So we're doing a contrapositive here. So this x double star is given. It's not in the inclusion of y. What we need to do is we need to find a functional that's in the annihilator of y such that x double star does not annihilate this functional. And I find this is the point of the proof where your brain starts to, to go to sleep. <laughs> we want to show, what do we want to show? We want to show that x double star is not, that we want to show that x double star doesn't annihilate everything that annihilates y. So we need to find a thing that annihilates y and show that x double star does not annihilate that. <laughs> is everybody okay with this? Okay, enough. All right. Now, since x is reflexive, uh, we know that x double star, which is in the double dual of x, is equal to j of x for some x in x. And x is also not in y. Let me write that set minus a little bit clearer. Because x double star is not in the embedding of y. So by reflexivity, this pre-image X is not in Y. Okay. Now, what do we want to do? We need to find a functional. And whenever you find yourself needing to find a functional, you use Hanbana. Because Hanbana gives you functionals, right? What does Hanbana tell us here? There exists a functional X star. such that when you pair it against X, you get one. And that functional also annihilates Y. This is using that X is not in Y. So you've got Y, some subspace, and you've got the vector X. And you can use functionals to, to do that separation, right? You can get a functional that's one on this vector and kills everything in that subspace. So this is our functional x star. And we needed to find a functional in y perp. So we've, we've done this first condition here. And we need to show the other condition there. So what is this? x double star is j of x. That's how we chose x. By definition, this is x against x star. And by construction, this is 1. And because everything is reasonable, one's not zero. And that's the second condition we needed to show. So X star is the desired functional. Now let's unpack everything we've got. What did this show? This shows that the inclusion of Y is the double annihilator of Y. So, y is isometrically isomorphic to j of y. I'm just going to write equals rather than isometrically isomorphic. y is j of y, which is y double perp, which is isometrically isomorphic to the dual of x modulo the annihilator of y dual. And it's a dual space. <laughs> and just to go back to the very beginning, therefore every subspace of X is a dual space, which tells us in particular that every separable subspace of X is a separable dual space. And you can replace is a separable dual space with has infinity mon gal convergence property. So now every separable subspace of X has that Martin Gale convergence property and therefore X itself has the Martin Gale convergence property, which is what we wanted to show. 
and all we used was that x was reflexive. There we go, that's nice. And all the nice Barnack spaces are reflexive, so in particular, all the nice Barnack spaces have this Martingale convergence property. Even the nice Barnack space are with the counting measure. So we're getting towards the end of the session, which is good. That proof is some, um, yeah, it's a nice proof. It's not an easy proof. You, if you want to really understand all of that proof, you need to be comfortable with annihilators and quotient spaces as well. And quotient spaces are one of these things that a lot of people in functional analysis get scared of because they don't come up that often, but they are important. You do need to know quotients. Um, and what else do I want to say? And we're kind of getting abstract now as well. Like we're thinking of Barnack spaces and Barnack space properties. But if you're interested in probability in Barnack spaces, you can go back and think, well, great. Now we know that in a reflexive Barnack space, L infinity uniformly bounded martingales have almost everywhere limits, which is nice to know. So we used our sort of scalar valued probability theory and we used some abstract stuff in functional analysis and we combined it all together. And that, yeah, we got a nice probabilistic result. But this course isn't called probability in Barnack spaces. It's called, you know, Barnack valued analysis. And what, what's all of this got to do with analysis more broadly? Like if we consider, if we care about the analysis of Barnack valued functions, what good does it tell us? What, why do we care that reflexive Barnack spaces have a martingale convergence property? What's so good about martingales? Why do we want them to converge? Because as I've said before, the martingale convergence property is equivalent to a different property, the radon nicotine property. And that's got way too many different equivalent characterizations. And it's, we do need to know that our Barnack spaces have that property for Barnack valued analysis. So I'll quickly introduce this property in the last minutes. And we are moving now into chapter, can't spell chapter, chapter. Uh, chapter four, we finished chapter three, we're moving on. Uh, five minutes, can I give the definition of the radon nicotine property in five minutes? No, I can't, but I can tell you what the radon nicotine theorem is in scalar valued, you know, classical measure theory, just as a reminder. So let's briefly recall, if you have two measures, signed measures, remember a signed measure is just, it's a scalar valued measure, but it can be positive or negative, or it can be complex valued as well. That's not an issue. If you have signed measures, on a measurable space S, then we say that nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. And we write this as nu less than less than mu. If for all A in the sigma algebra, such that mu of A is zero. So A has got zero mu measure. It follows that nu of A is also zero. This is absolute continuity of a measure with respect to another measure. It's all scalar here. And the radon nicodeme theorem, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing radon or nicodeme wrong. I'm Australian, that's my excuse. Uh, consider a sigma finite measure, uh, measure space. So I've got a measure mu, which is sigma finite. I'm, I'm assuming all measures are sigma finite, but I'm just going to point out here that we need sigma finite here. Let mu be a signed measure. So mu is not a signed measure, mu is just a classical measure. And we take a signed measure nu uh, on A such that nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. Then the theorem says there exists 
a unique function h, which is mu integrable, such that the measure, the new measure of every set a is equal to the integral of h d mu on a. This is for all measurable sets a. We write this as mu equals h mu. Or you might also write h is d nu d nu. So h is what's called the radon nicotine derivative. And this d nu d mu notation makes sense when you put it inside the integral. So h is d nu d mu d mu, which should be d nu, right? Just to use dodgy Leibniz notation. I think it's Leibniz notation, maybe not. Infinite, fake infinitesimals, we can call them. So this radon Nicodem theorem says, if you've got a measure, which is absolutely continuous with respect to another measure, then it's actually just a function times that other measure. You don't have measures that are too wild, you know, if they're absolutely continuous with respect to another one. It's a classification of, of measures with respect to absolute continuity. The radon Nicodem property for, of a Banach space will be this theorem, but instead of measures, we're going to have vector valued measures, what are called vector measures. So the measure of a set, say mu of A, will be, well, will be a vector in a Banach space X. So we're going to have vector measures. The radon Nicodem property is the vector measure radon Nicodem theorem, which turns out to depend on the Banach space. And it turns out that the radon Nicodem property is equivalent to all of the Martingale convergence properties. Well, they are all equivalent and it's equivalent to the radon Nicodem property. And we're gonna show this equivalence by finding two other equivalent conditions. And we're gonna make a big loop of conditions implying other conditions. Radon Nicodem is going to imply Martingale convergence properties. They're going to imply the non-existence of bounded separated trees. That's going to imply that every bounded subset is what's called dentable, which is a geometric condition. And that's going to imply the radon Nicodem property. So all these properties are going to be equivalent. And later on when we do, and these will, this will also be equivalent to the duality property of Bochner spaces, that the dual of the Bochner space LP is equal to LP prime valued in the dual, which is probably the most significant application of this property in vector valued analysis, I guess, because we do care a lot about Bochner spaces and knowing what their duals are is important. And finally, all reflexive spaces have this property because reflexivity implies the infinity Martingale convergence property, as we showed before, and that's equivalent to the radon Nicodem property and all of these other properties. And yeah, when we start dealing with UMD spaces, we're gonna see that those are reflexive. So those have all these nice properties. I can hear the, the church bell in the background, which means it's the end of the lecture. <laughs>